Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Paul Gulliver. I'm the chair of the communication department at Bradley University. And on behalf of the Department of Communication and the Charlie Steiner School of Sports Communication, I'm happy to welcome you to the sixth and final panel of the second annual Charlie Steiner Symposium on Sports Communication. And we have a great panel in store for you. We recognize that to capture the complexities of sports communication industry requires our students learn not only from industry professionals, but community organizers, advocates, coaches, and athletes. And we have some of the greatest athletes in the world here this evening. This year, our lineup of panelists reflected a greater diversity in professions, perspectives, and experiences in sports. We're also committed to Bradley's mission to prepare our students for the global sports communication environment. We have become more intentional at exploring the relationship between the local, the regional, and the global sporting landscapes. At tonight's panel, these connections will be ever more apparent to you. Finally, beyond serving our sports communication students this year, we created a program that reached students and faculty across the campus and attracted members of the larger Peoria community. As we move forward with our planning for the third annual symposium, and please mark your calendars, that will be the same time next year and we're looking at the week of November 8th through the 15th. And as we move forward with that, we hope the Charlie Steiner School of Sports Communications programming continues to share knowledge across disciplinary boundaries and beyond the premises of Bradley University's campus. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists this evening. Starting my far left, your far right, Josh George is a four-time Paralympian and a five-time Paralympic medalist with one gold, one silver, and three bronzes from the London, Beijing, and Athens Paralympic Games. In Rio, he competed in five events. Josh is also a five-time world champion, most recently capturing the marathon title in London in 2015. Next to Josh is Susanna Scaroni, as a two-time Paralympian who competed in the marathon events in London 2012 and Rio 2016. She finished seventh in Rio in the women's marathon event. And Susanna has also represented the US in two world championships. Brian Seaman is a two-time Paralympian. He competed in track and marathon events at the London 2012 and Rio 2016 games. Brian finished fourth in the men's 800 meter race and fifth in the men's 400 race in Rio. And Stephanie Wheeler is a gold medal winning U.S. Paralympic coach and athlete. Stephanie won gold medals in wheelchair basketball as an athlete at the Athens 2004 and Beijing 2008 Paralympic Games and returned with the gold from Rio as the head coach of the women's wheelchair basketball team. And moderating the panel will be our outstanding professor of sports communication, Dr. Dunya Antonovich. Welcome all of you and welcome to the audience. Welcome to Bradley, and uh, welcome to Peoria. For some of you, welcome back to Peoria. Uh, those of you who are track athletes and the marathoners, you competed here in Peoria at the Steamboat Classic a few years ago, so it's good to have you here, and uh, we're certainly excited that uh, you're going to be sharing your experiences with us tonight. So it's been two months since Rio. What has your training schedule looked like? Well, we... Uh Fortunately, didn't have much downtime after Rio on the, on the wheelchair racing side, actually. Three weeks after we got back into the country, we raced the Chicago Marathon. Uh, and then just the weekend before this past one, we raced the New York City Marathon. So our, our downtime kind of has just begun, which uh, I'm sure my two teammates here can agree is really nice. Um, so it's, it's been a long year for us. We, we really we took about a week off after the Rio games um, before kind of getting ramped back up for the fall marathons. Yeah, um, I can just, would just echo what Josh says. It's pretty nice. Uh, since New York, we finished New York Marathon last Sunday. Um, we had all of last week off, and then now we're moving into a training that's not focused on our racing chairs whatsoever. And it's just, even though it's different and like, I've been really sore the past two days just for doing other exercises. Um, it's pretty nice to be in a phase where 
we can just not focus on racing chair specific stuff and it's so nice. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to hanging out with my dogs more. <laughs> um, we came back and it was pretty much, uh, got right back into the, the whole, we were still in our racing chairs doing marathons and stuff and I'm much more of a sprinter than a marathoner so I already tend to not enjoy marathons for the most part, yet I do them anyway. And so um, having marathon season be over for the time being is, is uh, nice and uh, some of the holidays are coming up so that'll be fun. Um, from a basketball perspective, um, I took, I think, like three days off the week that we got home, and then I had to get right back in the gym with my student athletes at the University of Illinois. So um, I'm really looking forward to Thanksgiving break because we get a few days off and away. So, um, and then April. April will be my downtime. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to April. <laughs> like every college coach ever, right? That's right. I'm looking forward to April. <laughs> So you're all training at the University of Illinois. Um, what brought you to the U of I, and uh, what does that program offer that you might not be able to find anywhere else? I, go ahead. Oh, well, so Josh has the most experience out of all of us on this table in terms of wheelchair racing. Um, and one of the main reasons that I was drawn to go to the University of Illinois was because of the caliber of athlete um, that, that trains there for wheelchair racing and wheelchair basketball as well. Um, and so for me, we, the university has a history um, of excellence and producing excellence, and I wanted to be a part of that tradition, and so um, I wanted to be like Josh George. And you wanted to train with me. <laughs> um, and so for me, it was uh, knowing that I could go to a university and receive uh, an incredible education, as well as train with some of the best athletes um, from around the world. Um, that was a huge selling point to me. Yeah, I was, I mean, U of I has, it's one of the oldest uh, wheelchair sports programs in the country, one of the oldest in the world. Um, so it had just a, a rich history of adaptive athletics. Um, and I was actually, I was recruited to, to go to the university in basketball. It had a really well-established basketball program uh, when I was looking at schools. And uh, from a racing standpoint, I wanted to continue my racing, but I didn't really know as much about the racing program at U of I. Um, we sort of, it, it, the racing program there has kind of ebbed and flowed, and we're, we're at a point now where we're consistently considered one of the best racing programs in the world. Uh, but I honestly came out to U of I for, for basketball. Yeah, sure. Um, I came over from Washington State because as a, I was fortunate to grow up in wheelchair sports for a juniors program. Um, I played wheelchair basketball and raced with a team out of Spokane in high school. And then in that environment growing up, you just you hear about the U of I as kind of like the pinnacle of what a junior athlete could be. Like you go there and um, I wanted I wanted that. And I knew the coach from a local race he would come to. And so um, for me, it was that like close connection to Adam, who's our coach, and uh, that I could go to the University of Illinois and be a wheelchair athlete. Uh, that was my biggest motivating force. Yeah, we certainly didn't choose to go here because of the cornfields. So, um, <laughs> well, you notice not like Washington. <laughs> you'll notice that we're none of us are from Illinois, um, and we'll talk more about opportunities, I think, a little bit later. But um, we all we all ended up here for the opportunity that it presented us. And yeah. have never left. <laughs> no. Yeah, and I echo what these guys said, too. I actually left and came back. Um, I was recruited so I. as a student athlete to play wheelchair basketball. And like these guys, I came because, well, actually, unlike these guys, I came because for female athletes that wanted to play wheelchair basketball, um, when I was starting college, it was actually the only university that offered a women's collegiate wheelchair basketball program in the entire country. So it was either choose to stay home and go to college in North Carolina or have this opportunity to go be able to play sport, see how great I could be at wheelchair basketball while also getting a great education. So um, my options were actually quite limited, and, um, but it was a very easy choice for the reasons that these guys have already talked about. Um, we have this long tradition of excellence, and I knew that going to the University of Illinois, I could get the best coaching in the world. At the time, the wheelchair basketball coach there was the best coach in the world, and um, I knew I would get a phenomenal education and all the support that I needed to be great at whatever I wanted to be great at. 
And yeah. speaking of, of excellence, if, uh, if any of you followed uh, Illinois uh, Wheelchair Athletics Facebook page during the Paralympics, you would see all these uh, profiles popping up of, of athletes. Obviously, here we have Team USA athletes joining us today, but uh, it's my understanding that a lot of the athletes who compete for other uh, countries also train at the University of Illinois, even beyond their intercollegiate years. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about Rio. I you know uh, we might be all eager and curious to hear from your perspective how, uh, the, um, how your experiences were. We heard um, a lot of negative news in media coverage, ranging from environmental concerns to um, political turmoil to budget problems uh, re leading up right to the Paralympic Games. What were your experiences in Rio? How, how would you describe them to us? I like to describe it as an experience, <laughs> um, <laughs> mainly because, um, so Rio was my second Paralympics, and so um, I w went to London in 2012, four years before that, and so you, London set the bar very high in terms of uh, games. Not only was it my first game, so I mean, granted, I had nothing else to compare it to. Josh can, and Steph can actually probably talk more about their experiences prior to London, but um, from my perspective, London was incredible in that, um, in terms of the promotion and the, of the awareness and um, just kind of how everything fell into place. And Rio was, it was good. Um, there were definitely some, some pros and cons. I think that there was a lot of um, over-sensationalized negatives that were portrayed in the U.S. media and things that, as an athlete, um, I didn't really... I wasn't too concerned about, um, and I don't, I don't think many of us were either, but um, there were definitely other aspects of it that they were not prepared for, and um, we had to deal with that. Um, I mean, the power to our building was, or our, ha our half of the building was shut off one time because there was sewage leaking into one of the showers, and so, I mean, that's not something that you ever really kind of plan to anticipate at a Paralympic Games, but um, we, we did. <laughs> So, um, so I like to say that it's an experience, but um, I think everyone else can kind of talk about their experiences as well. Yeah, I, um, I'll just say my, probably what stands out the most um, between the two games is, uh, was when I got to London, that was my, also my first games, um, the, like the level that you are perceived as your athleticism in London, People saw me as an athlete, even out on the streets when my family and I went to go look around, and that, I'd never really experienced that in the U.S. ever. Um, and um, the, so the amount, and then I went to watch all the races at the track um, in Rio, or in London, because I, I only raced in the marathon, so I got to go and spectate. And the noise level in the stadium in London was like, you couldn't really think. It was so loud, and everybody was so sincerely excited to see the races um and it was it was different in rio there the stadium there would be many events where there wasn't many people at um so that's that was one big difference that stood out um however i still i, I got to go over to olympic park and people were really really excited to come and take pictures with us um i'm not sure if it was usa specific athletes but um, we were trying, like, we were trying to go to get to a basketball game, and we got stopped for like a half an hour, and people just like kept coming, wanted to take pictures with us. So it was still a neat, it was still a pretty neat experience. Um, they were sincerely excited to see us in Rio. Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised actually with uh, the turnout. You, all the stories leading up to the games, um, well, all the all the negative stuff, we sort of anticipated being overblown. Um, I mean, it was safe, it was clean, it was, you weren't really at a risk of, of anything. You had to be careful, you know, don't drink the water. But um, outside of that, it was, it was safe and clean enough. Um, and, and then for the on the Paralympic side, we kept getting these stories that only a fraction of the tickets had been sold to these events. Um, and they actually, they, they made a really good push the two weeks prior to the games to, you know, get people excited about what was coming into the city. And um, while the turnout wasn't spectacular, I mean, we were coming off of the best Paralympic Games in the history of the event from London uh, with sold out stadiums where people actually purchasing tickets and selling out a stadium, which was the first at a Paralympic Games. Um, so to, to compare Rio to that, um, you know, Rio kind of took a step backwards in that regard, but there were still more people than I anticipated. Um, on, the, on the athletic side, it was 
a bit different for us. There isn't really that track and field culture in Brazil. So Steph can probably speak to the basketball side. I played basketball in Brazil before, and then they tend to understand basketball a lot better than they do track and field. So I think that was um, part of the difference with us, whereas, you know, London has a, a pretty solid, London and, and Europe in general has a pretty solid track and field culture. Um, so from our standpoint, that made a huge difference. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was better than I anticipated in terms of fan support. Yeah, and basketball is definitely different. Um, you know, our arena, both arenas that we competed in were in Olympic Park, which is where basketball arenas were, tennis competition venues, swimming, uh, cycling was all there. And they actually broke records during the Paralympics with the number of people that they had coming through Olympic Park. I think, you know, one day there were like 160,000 people that came through Olympic Park um, in some way. And so, like, there were times where we, you know, the buses that take you from the village to the venue, they drive around sort of a back way, and you could see through, um, like, little doorways that they had, and it was absolutely packed. I mean, shoulder to shoulder people, absolutely packed. And that was translated into the arenas for us, um, especially during um, our medal round games. I mean, the arena that we played in, I think, held about 13 or 14,000 people, and it was pretty much full um, for our semifinal and final game, So, which is pretty typical. Um, like Josh was saying, you know, Brazil has a really huge basketball culture, and so um, I think that we were pretty fortunate. That's a culturally relevant sport there, and so um, we were able to, to reap the benefits of that. Um, the most lasting memory I had is as the gold medal game is going on, and it wasn't just our, I mean, our fans were sitting right behind our bench, but it was probably like a minute and a half left, and, you know, we pretty much realized that we were going to win at that point, and literally everybody in the stadium other than German fans were chanting USA, and, like, it was ridiculously loud, and so um, the fan support for us was great. Um, you know, we were really lucky with, like, transportation and stuff like that. Our venue was about 15 minutes from... Um, the athlete village, yeah, we were really fortunate. So we didn't have to deal with a lot of the transportation issues that I think some other sports had. So um, overall, our experience was was pretty fantastic. Um, yeah, the, I agree the, with the, the, the track stadium. And, yeah. The track stadium was significantly further away from. It was removed from just about every other venue. There was nothing else besides the track stadium. Um, so it, was, it took close to an hour to an hour and fifteen minutes from the village just to get there. Um, and then if you ended up, it, as an athlete, if you happened to, set, they, the scheduling was a little weird, but if you had a, pre, a prelim race in the morning and you made the final, there was a chance that you would then pretty much have to stay at the track all day because transportation was, it was so far away um, that it didn't make sense to go, to dry, sit on a bus for an hour and 15 and to an hour and a half to be home for an hour, to then get back on a bus, to go sit for another hour and a half, to then go run your race. And, um, and so, but I will say, despite the distance, I felt that the, the local organizing committee actually, in terms of putting on the games, it, they did what they were supposed to do. They, everything, in my opinion, went off without a hitch, which was, I never once was late to an event. I never felt like there was, you know, buses weren't on time, they, they everything, work the way it was supposed to in terms of the competition, which as an athlete, that's why you're there. And so you, all the other stuff you, you, we anticipated and we, you know, we were prepared for. You mentioned London, right? And, uh, and uh, even in Rio, uh, the sports that were able to get a lot of, uh, um, you know, fill the stadiums and get the audiences. What is it, uh, we have uh, some sports public relations uh, students in here. so. What is it that you think the organizing committees did well in order to get attention for the Paralympic Games or get people in the stadiums, sell tickets, right? Uh, and London has been talked about, the International Paralympic Committee talks about London as a, as a huge success for the Paralympic movement. So um, in, what, what is it that you saw that was implemented on a strategic level that made these games so successful? London just had an impeccable marketing machine uh, going into the games, um, like I said, they were, they were starting from a, a, a point a little bit ahead of Brazil in terms of, um, in terms of how disability in their culture is treated and in terms of how different sports in their, in their culture are treated. But uh, they put it upon themselves to do a one to two year marketing campaign, huge campaign to educate the population about the Paralympics uh, what the Paralympics are, what type of athletes compete in the Paralympics, the um, 
the intricacies of each sport. So they actually, it was, it was amazing in the sense that as a, an adaptive athlete, as a Paralympic athlete, um, our sports are often, um, the athleticism in our sport is often overlooked for the fact that we have disabilities, um, which you know is irrelevant by the time you get on the playing field. And, and what London did was they focused solely on the athleticism and they actually, uh, it, through their marketing campaigns, explained, okay, you know, this is wheelchair racing. What type of athlete do you have to be to excel at this sport? This is wheelchair basketball. What type of athlete do you have to be to excel in this sport? And they started that campaign so far out ahead of the games and they did so in, in a very strategic manner where they built up the personalities of UK athletes while they were doing that that by the time we got to London, there was such a buzz about the games, about the athletic side of the games, and about specific athletes. Like, if you raced for the UK, if you, if you were on the UK Paralympic team, um, it, was, it was a pretty sure thing that the population in London knew your name, knew who you were, was it, they were excited to actually see you race. And that's incredible. That was the first time in my life that I'd ever experienced that. It was the first time ever that I'd run into people in the streets uh, during the games and then be like, oh, I was at the pub last night and I watched you race. I'm like, are you serious? Like, that's amazing. I mean, they did, they did such an incredible job. Like I said, they actually sold, they sold out stadiums. They literally sold out stadiums. It wasn't just a full stadium, but they sold every single ticket. Um, you know, the, the prices were, were reduced from the Olympic Games, but still, it was the first time in, in the history of Paralympic sport that that has happened. And still, after Rio, it's still the only time that that has happened. Um, and it was, I think, in a large part due to that, that educational aspect that they really pumped through that, that marketing machine. Um, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, we were, we were racing against, in front of 80,000 people pretty much every single evening. Incredible. Yeah, I have nothing to add. Josh did a good job answering that. <laughs> it was really cool. I am there, so I don't know. <laughs> I would just say I've since gone to London Marathon, um, and some of the drivers that'll pick us up in the airport, they've talked about that and how big the games were for the whole country, like when they would finally get to go and watch the athletes that they'd been watching on commercials. And he's like, it was turning point to see those sports in like live action and everybody like, it was just huge to them, even. And it's actually, Suze brings up a good point, it's had residual effects as well. We, we, Suze and I race the London Marathon every April. Uh, so have I. <laughs> Brian does April. it occasionally. <laughs> this year. <laughs> Brian's done it once. Yeah, um, finally. <laughs> so we race the London Marathon in April, and ever since, ever since the, the London Paralympics, uh, the wheelchair field the elite wheelchair field at that race has been in, so well supported and like people have started turning up, spectators have started turning up to the course much earlier than they ever used to so that they could see the elite wheelchair field coming through and then see the elite running field. So oftentimes at marathons you will get um, maybe 50 to 75 percent of the crowds as the runners get just because our race starts earlier than the, the running race and we get through the course so much faster um, that people don't usually wake up quite that early in the day to come out and stand out in the cold and watch people run. Uh, but in London now, since the games, there's such a buzz about the wheelchair portion of the race as well that the crowd is the same for us throughout the entire length of the course as it is for um, for the runners, and they have, they always have one of the favorites in the race, this guy named David Weir, and it gets annoying, frankly, but you go <laughs> through the whole course and you're, go Dave, go Dave, go Dave, and, which is cool, they actually know a wheelchair racer by name, um, and that's a huge step forward for us. Most of us experience the games through media coverage, right, and, and uh, certainly we see, we saw some media coverage through NBC this year, um, some of it was aired during night hours as we talked about it, 1 a.m. through 5 uh, a.m., um, but um, certainly there is, a, there is an attempt to, to give more attention to the Paralympics. Um, how have you seen the media coverage evolve over the years, especially Stephanie and Josh, you've been to, to uh, some of the earlier games as well. Have you observed any changes? Yeah, I've seen a huge change. Um, my first Paralympics was in 2004, and we were in the gold medal game, and no one in my family could watch it. Like, I had 
a couple of family members in the audience that would watch or that were there to watch, but none of my family members back home could watch. Um, to where now in Rio, when I'm coaching, um, my family wasn't there. They were gathered at my house in Champaign with a bunch of our friends, able to watch it on our TV, streamed, but on our TV. Um, so that's a huge change um, for us on the Paralympic side, just because usually they're hearing about it either through um, our governing body with the National Military Basketball Association. We, it was very little coverage, even from um, the U.S. Olympic Committee and U.S. Paralympics back in 2004 as well. So it's gone from very, very little coverage to now where my family back home can watch. Um, we've actually, we've had recruits in town um, the past couple of weeks visiting, and uh, every time we have one in town, their parents are walking up to me, and they're like, hey, we saw you on TV. We saw you guys play in the gold medal game. Um, so that's really cool. Um, I was in the grocery store um, probably about a week after I came back, and people knew, like, who our team was and that we had competed and that we had won. And so that's a complete 180 for us um, in Paralympic sport. What I will say, and, and what we've touched on is just, you know, it's, it's now, we've taken that step to have it on TV, and we've taken the step to have it, you know, where more people can access it, and now we have to take the next step of more of the coverage being in times where people can actually watch it. Uh, and it's not from 1 to 5 a.m., it's from, it's in prime time at 7 p.m., and you're told you're going to get to see Josh George and Tatiana McFadden and Gail Gang, who's one of our student athletes that was on the wheelchair basketball team. And those athletes are pumped up just like you heard about, you're going to see Michael Phelps and you're going to see Katie Ledecky and you're going to see um, LeBron James play. So um, I think now that we have the coverage, it's how we evolve that coverage and how we make sure that it's um, getting the equal billing and equal footing that um, our Olympic counterparts. Yeah. Like I think the, the fact that NBC actually had coverage this year was, was a huge step forward, which is a little bit sad to say, but NBC has owned the rights to the games for... They owned them in London, they owned them in Beijing, and, and uh, the only thing that we got out of them owning the rights was a two-hour post-game special that was aired a month to two months after the games had ended. Um, so the fact that we were actually on TV while we were still competing uh, was, was big this time around. Um, you know, but there's, obviously there's still a long ways to go. They had something like... I think after they cut down the hours of coverage, they were in the 70s, I think, hours of coverage. They had 70 hours of coverage for, I don't know, what, 300 hours of sporting event um, or 400 hours of sporting event or even more. Um, Which, I mean, we got five, I think, in London. Five was... The five hours? Five hours for London. So, I mean, you'll take 70, but, I mean, the right. problem is most of that was from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., and, I mean... I like track too, but I'm not staying up to watch those races. Like, yeah. oh, whoop de doo. And with, um, yeah. So without the prior coverage too, of like, no one is gonna want to stay up from one to five if they don't know those people are. Right. My parents didn't stay up time. to watch me from one to five. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is interesting. Like um, as as you guys will continue to see, it's not just having coverage; it's how that coverage is used. So I think we made great strides that there, there is coverage now, but um, you know, you, again, you compare what NBC did to what, uh, what was it, Channel 7 did. Channel 4. Channel 4, Channel 4 sorry, Channel 4 did in, in London. And whereas Channel 4 created a viewership in the lead up to the games, um, and, and actually Channel 4, by the time the games came around, they were turning away companies who wanted to buy advertising during the, the broadcast of the games. They, they filled all their spots and they had more people coming in and they actually had to turn people away, which is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and so NBC now, you know, they, they had some Paralympic coverage, they put it on TV, but there was, there was nothing in the lead up to sort of build interest in it to make sure that that coverage was actually valuable. Um, so, you know, we have, we have coverage now, hopefully this will become a consistent thing. And now it's just pushing to see how that coverage is used um, and hopefully more effectively used. There, there, are, there are avenues that they can follow. I mean, a lot of us, we, we reference the marathons, and the marathons right now, um, the ma especially the major marathons in the world, there are six major marathons, uh, Tokyo, London, Boston, Ch uh, Berlin, Chicago, and New York City. And those races, every year, they have wheelchair fields, all of them except for Berlin, they have really good wheelchair fields, and they've, they've moved to a point where the media coverage now is focusing more and more on the elite wheelchair athletes as well. Like our value has been um, elevated in these races and media is taking note as well. So you'll see, 
you know, the, the playing field leveling a little bit in the marathons and, and, and hopefully some other adaptive sports and that, you know, over time should filter into how NBC treats their coverage or whoever, um, I don't know if NBC re-up with USOC, but whatever channel ends up buying the rights. And I think one of the really good things that NBC did do though, and I can speak from the basketball perspective is, um, you know, they came out to a couple of our training camps to, to get some, some pre-Paralympic coverage, but every time I went through, you know, after the game, you have to go through this mixed media zone where you, you speak with members of the media, and every time I went through and spoke with someone, it was solely questions about the game. I was spoken to just like any other coach was spoken to at the Olympic Games, and that was absolutely huge um, because generally or quite often we'll get questions that really don't relate to our sport at all. Um, and so that was a, a really interesting thing that I could just sit and talk basketball, which I love to do. And so I could sit with our interviewer and just talk about basketball and what our expectations were and how I felt about our performance in that game, um, what I think about our next game coming up, how do I feel like our chances for a medal are. And so it was really refreshing to be asked questions that were solely related to my sport and my athletes versus um, about my disability and how I've overcome it and if it made me sad and if it made me happy and you know what my feelings were surrounding that like I just wanted to talk basketball and I could and that was awesome I thought that was a really great thing that I don't know if it was that way with other sports but I thought that was a really good thing that they did um, with the with the people and personalities they chose to send over to Rio um, to work the Paralympics yeah they actually they did the same thing for racing that's a, a good point our um, Lewis Johnson, who was their main, main reporter at the track, did a phenomenal job of trying to learn the intricacies of, of all the different events that were there um, and just talk sport, talk track and field. Um, so that was, they, you know, NBC sent professionals and the professionals did their job and, and, and that was really nice to see. Mm -hmm up on that and to give our audience a little bit of a context, what are some of the, the types of questions that uh, you would prefer not to get and what are some of the narratives that uh, perhaps you've seen in the coverage of, of the Paralympics? Um, we talked a little bit about that earlier, but for, for those of us who are following the Paralympics and for some of you who might be covering it, how would you help us avoid those? Overcoming adversity. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that, so, on the wheelchair racing side, Tatiana McFadden is arguably probably the most recognizable name in our sport um, for, um, she's a, a powerhouse, and so much, every um, story that she has done for, for national media has focused solely on her, uh, uh, she was adopted from a Russian orphanage, and I don't know how many times I have to hear that before it's like, we get it, you were adopted from an orphanage. Like, there's so much more to her and, and to her incredible accomplishments, but that's what gets focused on this, this young girl who was adopted and how she overcame spina bifida and she, you know, and all of us, I mean, assuming we do get any coverage is, oh, how you overcome your injury, you, a car accident or, you know, spinal cord injury, all these overcoming these things that really have no no part in my accomplishments as an athlete and they haven't played a part in my life since my injury. Um, but that's what the media or the interviewers like to focus on because that to them is compelling, but that's not compelling. My, my accomplishments as an athlete are what makes me compelling. And it's, it's actually, it's really interesting um, and, and you guys can, can vouch for this from, from watching the Olympics. The media loves those types of stories Anyway, uh, and, and so you, you see that in the Olympic Games about how certain athletes overcome adversity, but the sticking point with Paralympians is that when you do that with an Olympian, when you tell the sob story of the Olympian, it is told so within, within the realm that you are also seeing their athletic side. You're seeing the actual competition and what they've, what they've gotten to, and you're seeing them day in, day out as athletes, and so this... Uh, this little tearjerker story is backstory. Whereas with Paralympians, too often that little tearjerker story is the only story. And that's, I think, why, why it affects us negatively so much as athletes. If it, was just, if it was just part of the story, if it was the backstory, like, yes, you know, uh, our, how we ended up in a chair is a part of our life and a part of our history. Uh, it's no longer relevant to anything that we're doing now. Um, and so if it's told in that context as backstory, 
you know, that's fine. That's, that's what the media does with everybody. But it's just in the, in the world that we're in as Paralympians, when that is the only story, um, it just sends a, it, it sends a message that is counter to what we try to do as, as athletes. And I think that goes with sort of the expectation that's quite often put on people with disabilities is that you don't expect to see them excelling at a high level in sport or whatever their job is or school or whatever it might be. I think it's a certain expectation that we sometimes have and it's a, it's a lowered expectation for people with disabilities quite often. And so you, you see stories with that where it's like they tell your backstory and then it's, but even with all those odds, they have done X, Y, and Z, right? And so the expectations have been placed so low on us that, you know, it's amazing that we have accomplished this and it's amazing that we have, you know, gotten out of bed and can get in our car and, you know, brush our teeth. Like, that may sound really simple and naive, but it's true. Like, that kind of stuff happens. So questions that don't ask, please don't ask how I get out of my car and how I brush my teeth and, like, that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm dead serious. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've been, like, these are things that we've been asked in yeah. professional interviews. Yeah, so I think it's, it's, you know, questions that are within the context of what their lowered expectations are for people with disabilities rather than questions that are in the context of, you know, you're a phenomenal athlete. Let me ask you what your daily schedule looks like so that um, you can prepare to train at the highest level. What does your daily schedule look like so that you're ready to coach a team at the Paralympics? Like, that's what we want to be asked. That's how we want to be portrayed in the media. How do you feel about the notion of being inspirational? I was just about to say that, <laughs> but I think it goes exactly down to the expectations when it's framed in the terms of, oh, you see someone at the grocery, or they see us at the grocery store, and because we're there, they come up to us and say, I just want you to know you are so inspirational to me right now. And it, to us, comes out as, I don't even expect you to be able to go to the grocery store by yourself. And it's not a pleasant feeling whatsoever. And um, so, I mean, I get inspired by Olympians. I love watching the Olympics, and I think it's motivational and inspiring. And I, wanna, I want my... Um, compelling inspiration to be the things that I am putting forward and challenging others to do themselves, not lowered expectations that we should all hold of ourselves. When you, putting it into the context of sport, if you're looking, if you're asking a person with a disability and telling them that they're inspiring you, am I inspiring you because your expectations for an athlete with a disability are so low that you just, you wouldn't even imagine that someone with a disability would participate in sport? Or am I inspiring you because I'm really fast on the track and you know that's really cool to watch and it's, it's inspiring you to maybe go and do something, you know, something else with your life or even it's just cool to watch and you, you think that that's m motivating and inspiring. But don't let me be your inspiration because you didn't have the expectation to begin with. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, that was um, a little forceful. We're going to uh, show a clip, actually, that's uh, all about breaking stereotypes, right? Josh, do you want to Josh. tell us a little bit about the video clip we're about to see? Yeah. Um, it features him. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to show you an advertisement that ran during the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. Um, and... Uh, Yes, I'm, I'm in the advertisement, but uh, the, the reason we're showing you this ad is, is because its approach to the Paralympics and its approach to uh, a Paralympic sport is pretty much everything that we could have asked for. Um, so when you watch this, watch this clip, really pay attention to the language that's used in it, uh, it's, it's language and, and a portrayal that is not common in this country for a person with a disability. And it's narrated by Chris Pine. And it's narrated by Chris Pine. <laughs> it's another cool fact. Or not. <laughs> Do we get audio? You should just narrate it, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Be Chris Pine. You can't be Chris Pine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, 
got something. Chair was built for. This chair was built for breaking things. Like rules, stereotypes, and world records. This chair was built for breaking things. To remind us limits is just a little word that makes a swooshing sound when you pass it. This chair was built for breaking things. A tool designed by the world's best engineers to dismantle, destroy, and dominate. Driven by a will of steel, and destined to chase gold. This chair was built for breaking things, to reimagine, rethink, and redefine what it means to be an athlete. And once every limit has been passed, every expectation smashed, and every record broken together, we will have built something great. The ultimate driving machine. So you notice the language in there. Did they ever say the word wheelchair even? No, never. That's the, most, that's the thing that, to me, I think pops out the most. Like we, in the US, we function, unfortunately, on a very medical-focused model of disability. And BMW recognized the connotation that the word wheelchair has with people. When, when most people in this country hear the word wheelchair, they think, uh, you know, grandma or grandpa, great grandma or great grandpa, someone who, who has, is, has a, a lot of limitations with their mobility, uh, who is frail or weak um, or sick. It's, it's not commonly associated with high caliber athletics. And in this clip, in that commercial, it's always referred to as a chair to completely avoid that connotation. And then later it's referred to as a tool. It's a piece of athletic equipment. And, and Steph actually can talk a lot more about this, but one of the things that I personally find will, will help push Paralympic sport forwards is when we forget the fact that the athletes competing have physical disability and just acknowledge the equipment we use as equipment that we use. It is, you know, the racing chair is a tool for winning races and breaking world records and, and going faster than our competitors. And that's what it is. It's a tool. It's a piece of equipment. It's nothing more or less than that. And it's nothing that inherently means disability. And it's nothing that inherently has to be used by a person with a disability. Um, and I mean, Steph, if you want to elaborate sure. on that, yeah. Yeah, no, it, that's exactly the way that, that I view sport in general, adapted sport in general. I spoke about this a little earlier, but the, for us, the wheelchair is just a tool. And I, I, you know, I actually like using the word wheelchair because I'm trying to change the connotation and the stereotype around that word too. And, and just saying like, it is a tool for performance and success. That's how we look at our basketball wheelchairs. They're not fancy like the BMW racing chairs, but they are made from the best materials we can find, the lightest materials we can find, the toughest materials that we can find in order to perform at a very high level um, and to take a lot of contact and to be as fast and quick and light as it possibly can be. And that's just what it is. It is a piece of equipment and I think, um, you know, there's a couple different ways, and I guess we'll talk a little bit about this later with how we can move the Paralympic movement forward and, and you know, changes that can be made. But um, I, I think, you know, Josh said it really, really well. It's, it's, it's one of those things where once we kind of get past the, the value-laden image that we have of a wheelchair, that when you look at it, it, it has inherent value, not necessarily in a good way. I think once we get past that and we just see it as a tool that I'm gonna go knock the crap out of somebody on a basketball court with, then you know what, we're moving somewhere. And I think just to also touch on um, the language piece that, that Josh talked about, um, you know, for those of you guys in here that are you know, sport communication majors, and again, I, I spoke about this earlier, but I know there's new faces in the crowd. It's really important to remember just the power that your words have. And I thought that was a really poignant thing that the ad did, is it realized, BMW realized the power that its words had and the word choices that it used. You did not hear them say confined to anything. You did not hear them say um, wheelchair bound in any way, shape or form. And that's really, really important. 
um, because those words carry their, con their own connotation with them, right? We use words to create pictures and stereotypes um, about who a certain group of people are. And so it's really important if you guys are going to go out and, and talk about disability sport and write about disability sport, that the words that you choose reflect who we are as athletes and who we are as coaches rather than reflecting, you know, my mode of transportation. Since we're on the topic of strategies for change, I'll uh, turn it over to Brian and Susanna if you want to, and, and then Josh, you can take it from there. Uh, what are some of the um, changes you would like to see in the near future? Well, obviously, um, the more coverage um, would lead to more awareness, which would then potentially to more coverage. Um, I think that that's kind of something that everyone here would like to see. Um, but kind of going back, I think what I'd like to see is for the sport, for all adapted sport to grow. And I think that uh, I, I say adapted sport now just to, so that there can be a clarification between the two. But I, I don't think that there needs to be this delineation between adapted sport and able-bodied sport. Sport is sport. And uh, athletes are, whether or not use a wheelchair or not, are putting in the same amount of time and the same amount of effort to compete. And, uh, you know, Josh kind of touched on it real quickly, but um, getting people without disabilities involved in using basketball chairs or using racing chairs, it's possible. You guys, I mean, there's, there's nothing stopping you from hopping in a basketball chair and playing, playing wheelchair basketball. We have an able-bodied athlete on our team this year at the University of Illinois. Like she has no physical disability at all, and she's playing on our team. I think that racing chairs are a little bit more uncomfortable than a basketball chair, but um, there are people that, um, that can do it. And I think that by seamlessly integrating or trying to seamlessly integrate um, people without disabilities in getting them just to experience um, the, the, the sports as, as the way we do it, um, I think that, that is, um, that's a, a, a way for there to be more advocates for uh, disability sport and for people to just kind of have a better understanding of it. I think it was Guinness actually had an ad a few years ago. Um, it was that, a wheelchair mm -hmm. basketball ad that I really loved. I really liked, and they said the chair is just a piece of equipment, um, and it didn't stop um, this this guy who was in a wheelchair. He had his all of his other buddies that were playing basketball with him, and so I think that for me, that's just something that's really um, the the chair is just a tool, and I think that just being able to get more people involved will change the the connotation of adapted sports, and it will eventually just be perceived as sport. I agree one hundred percent. That was. What I was going to say, too, is my biggest moving forward a way people, if they want to try out cycling, they can get on a bicycle and try that out. And that's one way to more understand that sport. And it's the same with wheelchair sports, too. And um, I really think that's the best way to educate people on how it's not our disability that's creating these athletes. It's what we're doing with these tools. And... Um, I really would like to echo that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really, I think for the, for the growth of a, any sport and for the entertainment value of any sport, it's that experiential aspect of it that's so valuable. Um, like, if you watch Lindsey Vaughn ski in the Winter Games and you see her just flying down a mountain, a lot of people have skied before, a lot of people have gone down mountains a fraction of the speed she's going down and have that experience. So then when you watch her doing it at this highest level, there's that, that little bit of a, um, you know, relation between you and the athlete. You know, everyone's played basketball, everyone's played soccer, everyone's played baseball at some point in their lives. So when you watch those sports done at the highest levels and at the professional levels, there is a respect for the skill that is being portrayed when you see it on TV. Where adaptive athletics, and, and ultimately, if you're going to combine the Paralympics and the Olympics, you're going to have to cut events. And what events are you going to cut? There are, there are a lot of Paralympic events that are a lot less competitive than some Olympic events. Um, and then you have to make the, you know, there's hard decisions that have to be made. Like what, events are, what events are you cutting in order to actually have a, a games? Because uh, logistically speaking, if you're you'd have to extend the length of a games. The Olympics are already two weeks long. You have to extend them by at least another week if you were to combine the two. Um, you'd, and you'd still have to cut events, I think, to probably get it into three weeks. And, and then you're just, at, 
it's an awesome idea, but it's a complicated idea because someone's going to lose. And it's just a matter of whether you, whether the Paralympic movement wants to really ride the coattails of the, the super elite and the most elite and entertaining and competitive sports in the Paralympics, um, or go more on an inclusivity route and include a wider range of athletes with disabilities and a wider range of events. It's, it's kind of, it's complicated. You can't, you can't really have both, 100% of both. The dissenting view? No, 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 I agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. I really like your, the terms of inclusion. I, I like that. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal that. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm just curious, um, how do you feel about the word Paralympic? Well, mm -hmm. yeah, well, well I, I, I like it. Yeah. I think, it I think do you guys it, know why? I was just gonna say, do you know why it's called Paralympic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> para, para is just the Greek prefix, meaning equal and on a level playing field. So once, once people understand what the prefix of para means, I, I love the word um, because it's, it's equal and level playing field ideally, like in an ideal world, it's the Paralympics and the Olympics are on the same playing field. And then at the same time, it's the athletes in the Paralympics compete on a level playing field with each other. Um, we just have this unfortunate battle with the fact that the prefix para is often tied to paraplegic, which it has nothing to do with in this sense. Um, and so there's nothing inherently disabled about the word Paralympics. It's, it's just a matter of people ed educating, I guess, what that prefix means. And if you think about it, that doesn't even make sense because there are athletes that are you know, visually impaired or amputees and they're not paraplegics. Yeah, I know. So it doesn't even make sense, but. <laughs> Which is some of like, when you hear that, that word, sometimes there's negative connotations to it. The question, there you go. Um, how do you think that combining, because I know you just talked about combining Olympics, Paralympics, but in regards to like, the racing, I watched the uh, New York Marathon, I'm a runner myself, so. Oh, nice. And that's the only way I saw, I saw like in the early stages, I saw the, para, or the wheelchair coverage, and I know it was a really close race between the winner of the men's. What place did you take? I was third. You were third, okay. I was, and I, I was know, right behind those two guys. Yeah, it was an awesome, uh, <laughs> so I didn't mean to bring that up, that's yeah, a, a hard no, point. Okay. <laughs> but how do you think that, um, the combination coverage because there I I wouldn't have been watching that coverage and got to see that interesting of a race had I not been already watching the marathon for the runner race. So how do you think that can help the sport? Well, it def it definitely helps, and that's what's that's what's amazing about the marathons right now, and what they're doing such a good job with is including us in the coverage. You already have a built-in audience who's used to tuning into those races every year to watch uh, the running portion of those races. And then when, like yourself, they actually catch the, the wheelchair portion now because the media has deemed it uh, valuable enough to, to be a part of the broadcast, then you're, you're actually recruiting new fans to the sport. Um, and so that's, I mean, I think all of us up here, we really uh, push the, the, universe, the universal line of thinking where we don't, we don't necessarily want, you know, it, separate but equal isn't really a thing that we've ever strived for in this country. Um, we have a long history with that term, and it's still it's still the truth. We want, we just want equal. We, I mean, it, it, everything works better when it's when it's designed for an entire population, not separated. Even if both both groups are getting the same resources, it's always better if it's if it's inclusive, and that's. That's what, what marathoning right now is doing. And I think that's another reason why we push for an able-bodied population to, to you know, try their hand at these traditionally disabled sports and, and using it as a piece of equipment. I know my brother's trained in a racing chair before. He got, I think it was the fittest he'd ever been, at least upper body-wise, when he was training in a racing chair. And he has no disability. He just, he did it for, to train, to get fit. And uh, it's stuff like that that I think is what we all strive for. And I'm going to put you on the spot now, but do you think that you would be more inclined now to go follow more, like, 
more wheel, more of the wheelchair marathons, like from the men's and women's side, now that you actually know that it, there's coverage for it, I mean, you can say yes because everyone's looking at you now. But <laughs> um, but I mean, and that's and that's that's what's kind of important. There is such a limited awareness about about our sport, um, and that so these these moments that we have to get someone like you who didn't have any interest in it before, but you saw it and you you remember you you know how close the race was and you thought it was exciting. Like that's kind of what we're trying to build on and to to generate that excitement so that more people are interested and and be you know. Uh, try to learn more about the sport. That race is more exciting than that. It normally is. Yeah. Normally, yeah. yes, it's normally. Well, see, and that's, we, we don't have any misconceptions about that, too. I mean, all of us up here, we understand why, um, why sports exist in the media and why they exist in culture. I mean, it's an entertainment thing. It's, you know, the, the economic value of a professional athlete, like, people can complain all they want that you have pro athletes on eight-figure contracts, but the the entertainment value and what they're creating in the economy values them at eight figure contracts and we don't we don't we're not looking for handouts we're looking for the opportunity for a population to see how exciting our sports are um, and we're trying to market our sports in that same way to to work in the free market um, and so the, our media access is our our way of of sort of advertising the excitement of our sport to to gain followers and then build our value. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to you over. We're going to get to you. We've seen you. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> we see your hand. We see your hand. Okay, I guess I was going to just go off more, like, um, the cycling and the training side. Um, I would assume that, you know, a training week for you guys is almost identical to that of any other person in the marathon and such. So between, you know, thresholds and intervals and things like that, what for each of you guys is probably was probably like your most brutal workout that you've had to go through in preparation oh. for any event probably okay i'll talk i'll start um i so have you ever you guys ever used a ski erg it's kind of like a rowing machine but it's um upright so you're doing like cross-country skiing motion um we last winter did like these like high intensity like cycling uh, spinning videos, but on the ski erg, so you had to follow their high intensity um, like intervals throughout this like over hour extended of time, and so I almost threw up at the end of it. Like I don't think my heart rate has ever been that high at that many times over that much time. And I wonder if Josh and I are going to say the same thing, but I think <laughs> so. I think so. Standing start eight hundreds, and we would do five or six of them, and we. I don't, God, they're awful. So uh, this was this was a workout that our coach tossed in in our training prep for Rio, um, just to see how we would react to it, uh, and and it was awful. With wheelchair racing, one of the toughest parts of a race in wheelchair racing is that very start of the race when you're generating momentum. For for a runner, you know, you just step and go and you're moving, but you have to overcome inertia in a in a wheelchair to get going. So it takes a lot of strength. Um, and so one of uh, this workout, we had, uh, it was like six by 800 meters, which 800 meters is two laps around a track, a half mile. We had to do each one at a standing start. So you, you have to use that power to, to um, overcome inertia at the beginning of each rep. And then the goal of the rep was to actually run a positive split, which means that the second lap is slower than the first lap. And in running, this is easy because you, you burn out your energy, uh, in the first lap and the second lap is, is commonly slower. But in wheelchair racing, when you have the first lap, you're starting from a standstill, and the second lap, you're crossing that line at you know, 18, 19 miles an hour, you have to really go hard in that first lap to do it faster than you can the second lap. And I don't think I actually ever did a positive split in any of these no, workouts, but the fact that you had to sprint 100% for a 400 and then just carry it around for another 400 that was it was brutal it was awful and if you're trying to chase josh and like stay in his draft it's not fun it was, so it was rough speaking from experience <laughs> coaches are evil yeah yes. they are <laughs> it wasn't even like a normal 800 it was like as hard as you could go it was like race pace. there was no was, pace oh god <laughs> pain now all the coaches in the room are taking notes here yeah, right. to implement <laughs> uh oh <laughs> This guy had yep. a question. Yeah. Okay, okay, my turn. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit from each of you uh, what you feel like was your single greatest performance in your career or one that really helped define who you are as an athlete. So don't be afraid to brag. Uh, as an athlete. Um, I have two. One, um, when I came on the national team, I was a pretty young player. Uh, I was 21 uh, when I first made the national team, and I was 23 when I competed in Athens, so still pretty young. And so I didn't play a lot. Um, I played pretty limited minutes. I was a really good cheerleader from the bench um, and took my minutes when I could get them. But sort of the next cycle, I knew that I was going to be a more prominent member on the team. And so um, the year, two years after the Paralympics, gosh, I can't remember what year it was. Uh, it was before Beijing, though, and we went to this tiny little competition in Japan. And usually a basketball team, you have a roster of 12 people. And we took eight um, because it was just this little developmental team we took. And um, it was kind of like a breakout moment of my career. Like I actually I had to score. I had to do a lot of things that I wasn't um, – generally expected to do and I think that sort of spurred my confidence and spurred me on to um in Beijing I was a starter I played pretty big minutes um, she was a stud <laughs> and in uh the semi-final game we were playing Australia and it was probably my highest scoring game ever in the Paralympics it was only 15 points but it was I was usually just a hardcore defensive player but um I was really able to give to my team in a way that I had never been able to give to them before and um as a leader and um, someone who had confidence to step up and shoot when I needed to and continue to play some lockdown defense. I hit six out of six free throws in, like, the last minute of the game to kind of seal it and take us to the gold medal game. Stud. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> those are my most favorite moments as a player. Ah, okay. I, I don't know what Josh is going to say, but I think <laughs> – so probably for me um, – I have a couple, but I think the one that kind of is most prominent currently in my career um, – we were racing in Switzerland, and um, Switzerland has some of the world's fastest tracks for some reason. They're just, I don't know why, they just build them fast there. And so um, we were at this really fast track meet, and uh, I had to run a time to keep my, I was, it's very complicated. I needed to run a certain time to, to keep my, my national team status, and so Josh was going to help me. Josh and I raced together. Um, and so... Um, we, it was a pretty fast day. We had some, we had run some pretty fast races before, and um, Josh had said, like Josh was like, all right, we're just gonna we're gonna run, and we're gonna um, we're gonna just get your standard, so it's, we're, you're good to go. Josh is good like that. He gives me confidence. And so we uh, we were going, and then we had some good races, like I had said. And so the we were running the 800, and um, it was like I think it was right before the start, and he was like you know, I think we could go really fast. Like, we might be able to, to break the world record. And I remember saying to him, you, know, you can break the world record. I won't. Um, and I just needed to run my time. And I was like, I'll just try and stay in and see what happens. Well, turns out we both went under the, the existing world record. So Josh currently holds the world record in the 800. Um, and so for me, that was probably one of the coolest things ever because even though I didn't actually break a world record because second place doesn't get a world record, um, <laughs> despite going under it, um, the, it was probably one of the coolest moments for me because um, that was something that I had never kind of even considered as a possibility in terms of um, like my checklist of things that I wanted to accomplish in my athletic career to say that I went under an existing world record. Um, and so, I don't know, that's kind of my favorite moment. So and that was, it was the longest standing on record on the books for us. Yeah, no um, one thought it was ever going to be broken. Yeah. And Josh broke it. And now I don't think anyone's going to break it. So I hope not. <laughs> that works, that works. Um, okay, I think for mine, I would probably say uh, the Rio Marathon, actually. Um, it was such a different race in terms of the women's field and the, the depth that we have now, and the way that I can, that that kind of was drawn out was, it was a pack race, like, the entire time, and it even came into a sprint finish with the top eight, and... Um, they're just not usually like that. Usually the pack, there will be, I mean, like maybe three or four people that can work together for a while, but uh, you do end, it does end up stringing up pretty quickly. But in Rio this year, um, we all stayed together. There were times where a lot of people, like nobody wanted to take the pole. And in a women's race, in, in wheelchair racing, a drafting is a huge element of 
long distance. And um, to have enough people that nobody wanted to take the pole, it's usually like you know it's your turn and you have to pull then uh, on the women's side. And to be at the level where it becomes strategy and technical, um, it's neat to see that we're gaining that depth. And so that it became a sprint finish at the end of the Rio Paralympic Marathon was just like, it was cool on a whole host of levels and especially cool to be like there <laughs> personally in it. So um, that's still such a cool experience, I'll say. Oh, okay. Sorry. You better say the 800. <laughs> um, yeah, just because it's a special Time moment for you me. You broke the world record. So that, that world record race is uh, one of the highlights of my track career for, for sure. Um, and that, that track meet that weekend that we were there was still the fastest track meet in my life, pure speed wise. Um, and that, yeah, I was probably as shocked as Brian that we did we went as fast in that race because we, we beat the world record and we didn't just beat it, we beat it by a half a second. Um, so we, we were significantly under it, a record that we didn't think was quite touchable at the time. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, and then outside of that, one of my, well, I guess two of my highlights, uh, I'm going to combine two into one, but it's always been my goal. Uh, I've always wanted to be a marathoner and I've always wanted to excel in marathoning. And for... Um, in wheelchair racing, we, in the shorter races, were separated by classification. So in a lot of adapted sports, athletes, are, their athletes compete with different classifications. And what that means is you're given some sort of numeric value based on the amount of function that you can use. Um, it has nothing to do with, with talent um, or athletic ability. It's purely function. What is your injury level? Okay, we're going to group these athletes with similar injury levels to compete against each other and these other athletes with similar uh, injury levels. And in wheelchair racing, um, you basically have two major classifications. You have one classification for athletes who have full trunk control and even some leg function. Uh, so they can use all their core muscles, their abs, their, their back, uh, and even some of their legs. And then you have another classification for athletes like Brian and myself who have higher level injuries who can basically, we, when we're pushing a racing chair, we're generating power with everything from our chest up. So we have no abs, no lower back, no leg function, um, none of those muscle groups, those major muscle groups to actually generate power. And in the shorter races, you only race against your specific classification. But anything longer, and specifically in a marathon, all of those athletes race against each other. So the Athletes such as myself with a high-level injury will race against, if any of you guys decided to race, we race against each other. There's, it's an open classification. Um, and it had always been my goal to be able to win an open class race. Uh, and I, um, in 2014, I won the Chicago Marathon. Um, Suze would just mention the pack finishes. We actually, in 2014, we came through with, with 13 people a pack of 13 people at the end of a marathon. Uh, it was the largest pack finish that we had had to date and it was the most competitive Chicago to date. And I managed to win that race, beating guys with way more muscle function than myself. Uh, and then the following year in London, um, in an eight-man pack finish, I was able to win the, the London Marathon as well. And so those two races, to me, um, they really stand out. Um, they, they stand out. We, we talked about sort of overcoming adversity and how we don't like that, but in certain <laughs> ways, overcame like adversity. personally, personally, when you're, when you're overcoming adversity that's specific to your sport, like it's, that's a different thing. And so for me, I felt like I was over to, able to overcome a few um, inherent disadvantages um, to, to come out on top in those races. Where can we see you compete or coach next? In the near future, somewhere in the region? Somewhere in the region. Or, you know... You want to get them to the Tokyo travel. Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have budget for that in the School of Sports Communication? Take an overseas trip? Yeah, you oh, guys want to come to the Tokyo Marathon We generally in come back and we'll do Steamboat. Yeah. And we've done the Peoria Marathon yeah, before. We did the Peoria one, one time. Um, the, I don't actually remember when. It was in the summer because it was hot. It was May. It was um, with the, the, the Easter Seals. Seals. Yeah, 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 That was in May. Yeah, yeah so we've ago. done the Peoria Marathon. We've done Steamboat a few times. That's always fun. Champagne but, Half Marathon or the... Sh yeah, the Illinois, Illinois Marathon. Marathon. Um, we'll race that in April. Boston, if you're in Boston in April, we'll be doing the Boston Marathon. Does anyone here do Steamboat? Because anyone? Runners? 
Yes. <laughs> Come say. Of course you do. <laughs> Come say hi. Now you know who we are. Yeah. And for us, um, we're in season right now. We travel a lot. The next time we'll be in Central Illinois competing is in February, um, just after Valentine's Day. Um, we'll be down in Champaign. Otherwise, we're in Wisconsin, Kansas, Pennsylvania, Alabama. So. You guys can get the champagne and catch a wheelchair basketball tournament. That would be awesome because they are phenomenal. They're so much so exciting. While you're there, you're, you could probably grab a bike and come train with us because we'll probably be training that morning too before the games. <laughs> February training. I don't know if that would be fun. Oh, <laughs> never mind. We'll probably be inside. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and that might be the perfect question to end this session. And it was a great session. Thank you all for being part of the final session of the symposium. So you, you certainly punctuated our symposium for us. Thank you very much for, for being a part of it. And to all of you, thank you for coming. And I want to remind you that this marks the close of the second annual Charlie Steiner Symposium on Sports Communication. The third annual will be next November, so please keep that week open. And uh, we will again have a great day of sports communication issues. And so thank you for coming tonight. Please. Uh, be careful going home. Have a great evening. And again, a very big thank you to our athletes and our moderator, Dunya Antonovich. Thank you.